Hostages finally are free. Ronald Reagan begins his presidency. The Perry County Coal Gasification Project faces a new hurdle. I'm your Congressman Paul Simon. Join Senator Charles Percy and me as we discuss these issues on In Touch. This is In Touch with Paul Simon, a weekly report from your congressman on the issues that concern you the most. And now, Congressman Paul Simon. It's a pleasure to have uh, Senator Percy with us. Senator Percy is not only the senior senator from Illinois, but has emerged uh, in these last few months, uh, somewhat to your surprise, I assume, as well as the nation's, as the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I might say it should be a matter of no small amount of pride to the people of Illinois that we have someone in that kind of a key position. In Southern Illinois, as you know, Chuck, we're very much interested in coal and what we can do to promote coal. And one key thing that we were able to get passed in the House and the Senate was a provision for the Perry County Coal Gasification Project, which would be the biggest federal project in the history of Southern Illinois. Now uh, there are rumors that the transition team wants to hold back on that. Uh, uh, what does it look like from the Senate side and can we persuade the new president to, to go ahead, do you think? First, the, Paul, I'm delighted to be with you. Honored to be asked to be your guest. Uh, secondly, as you know, uh, the Reagan administration has uh, expressed some concern about about the synthetic fuels and their cost effectiveness, the long lead time it take, and the equivalent cost per barrel of, say, coal gasification. But third, it'll depend upon whether we've got enough clout with the administration. And uh, we have an unusual delegation, uh, not only a distinguished uh, congressman like yourself, but a lot of seniority now, and you've got clout, but Dan Raskinkowski, because the House is uniquely endowed with power by the Constitution for money bills. And the Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee is in the Illinois delegation, and uniquely the, the uh, Senate the is endowed with powers of the Constitution in the per field of foreign relations, and we do have that, the chairmanship of that committee. And we do have the uh, minority leader uh, of the House. So I think I am certainly intend to wage this battle as one of my number one priorities. And just as Locks and Dam 26 was my number one priority for so many years, and now is being funded, so too we intend to see that the Perry County Coal Gasification Plant and the unique combination of skills and talents we put together to, to make that development possible is funded. Obviously a key person here is the new Secretary of Energy, whom I haven't uh, met yet. Uh, are you acquainted with him, or have you known him for some time, I've, by any chance? I've talked to Jim Watts. I have not yet twisted his arm on this one. He's a big, tall man, you know, but he's a... And we're talking about Secretary of Energy so here, uh, rather than Interior, on this excuse one. Excuse me, on, they're very on this close. particular, they're, they're yeah. closely yes. related on this because of the environmental problems, right. and there will be impact studies. But Secretary of Energy, Charles Duncan, and I were very close. I intend to work just as closely with our new Secretary of Energy. We have not yet called on them. I'd really like to call them on this project in company with you. That'd I be think great. it should be a bipartisan approach. We ought to lay our cards right on the table. We ought to review with him so he personally knows how much work has gone into this project by all of us and how we would like to see this go forward as a very, very high priority. And while it's important to Southern Illinois, obviously it's important to the nation to move ahead in the synthetic fuels area. It is. I, I think that... Uh, uh, I supported the legislation, and of course we both fought very hard for, the, for this project. Uh, we have to have a range of alternatives to solve energy. Conservation is the first. That's the cheapest and the best and most readily available. And we have to, I think, deregulate oil and uh, certainly provide incentives for all of our uh, oil uh, drilling in Illinois and other states. Uh, but we need alternate sources, and certainly coal gasification with the abundance of our coal supply, and we are richly endowed. We want to become the Saudi Arabia uh, in coal for the country. And I think uh, direct mining, direct use of coal, as well as indirect use through coal gasification is essential for our national security and for the strength of our economy. We'll get back to you with some questions about the hostages in just a moment. One of a congressman's major duties is to help constituents who are having problems with federal programs. 
such as Medicare, Black Lung, and Social Security. If you're having a problem with these or other federal programs, I urge you to write, phone, or visit one of my district offices. The people in my Carbondale and West Frankfurt offices are trained to help you cut through the red tape that too often surrounds government agencies. Where it's necessary, I'll personally intervene in your behalf. My Carbondale office is located in the Federal Building at 250 West Cherry Street. The phone number is 457-3653. My West Frankfurt office is located at 212 West Main Street. The phone number there is 932-2560. My offices are there to serve you. I hope you'll use them. Chuck, I think it would be interesting for the people because of the real interest in the, the hostage issues and the, the, the concern that all of us have had. How practically it works, how an administration contacts the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, how closely do, does all this mesh? Well, as you know, I, I've just left the White House. I've just had a, my first meeting in the Oval Office uh, with uh, uh, President Reagan. Uh, we will work intimately uh, together. And just as in the past administration, it was not different in the Carter administration. Once I became chairman of the committee, it was almost daily contact uh, with either Secretary Muskie or Warren Christopher. Even though Warren Christopher was on different hours, I spoke to him uh, Friday morning uh, from uh, Chicago at 3.30 in the morning because that was a good time to reach him there. Uh, I've been an intimate part of many of the negotiations, not all of them. I haven't read all the fine print. But uh, certainly I stopped the negotiations at one point three weeks ago because what the terms were totally unacceptable. Warren Christopher agreed. He went back, and at 3.30 Friday morning, he said, I see light at the end of the tunnel. The objections you had have now been answered. Now, you mentioned you haven't seen all the fine print, but the basics as you see them right now, do they appear to be acceptable? They would appear to be, and of course, if we rejected them out of hand, it would fracture our relationship with Algeria, who at this stage have been magnificent, and they are a third world country. So it would have to be a major thing. When we take into account that the $2.8 billion that were sent over there, $3 billion was immediately sent back to pay American banks off, and that $4 billion is an escrow uh, to settle all these accounts, a pretty good deal was struck, I think. There was not, from what I could see, one cent of ransom paid and no involvement in the Iranian-Iraq war, which, of course, they kept trying to ease us into by one means or another. What lessons can we learn from this, this whole experience, this tragic experience, even though right now there is the exhilaration of seeing the the hostages back, but fundamentally it has been a very unhappy experience for our nation. It has been, and, and humiliating. Uh, the lesson, first lesson we can learn that I hope President Carter realizes a mistake, he did not observe the War Powers Act, he did not consult with Congress, he went ahead and assumed full responsibility for a helicopter rescue that many of us would have told him, and I had decided ahead of time with General Scowcroft and Dick Allen, who's now National Security Advisor, that such an attempt at this late stage was doomed to failure, and we could have told him that, and Bob Byrd would have told him that, but he never consulted with us. So let's, let's have a President of the United States consult with Congress. Secondly, there are solutions to these problems. We solved the kidnapping problem in the 30s after the Ken Lindbergh incident. We had an incident of a rage, a rash of, of hijackings, and we tightened security, and we literally stopped those, or put a, a big dent Virtually in, stopped. Virtually right. stopped, right. Uh, we have now tightened security a great deal for our, uh, for our uh, diplomatic corps abroad. But the Senate Foreign Relations Committee probably will hold hearings. I haven't discussed it in full with my colleagues, but probably will hold hearings. We have held them off until after the hostages are back. But we'll want to determine, looking to the future, how can we ever prevent this incident from happening again in our history? What can we do to prevent it? And if it occurred, how would we respond immediately, not six months later? And it seems to me that two things, and it's always easy by hindsight to look and say the president might have done this or that. One of the things he did seems to me to be fundamentally right, and that is freezing the assets. That clearly turned That's out right. to be a, a great help to us. The second thing was probably a mistake, and that is to announce immediately we would not use force. Even if you don't plan to use force, 
You don't announce. You don't tip your hand. That's exactly right. What if I may move away from, from the hostages to the new administration? What practically is going to be the difference, do you think, now? Or how are things going to be different for people in southern Illinois, in Harrisburg, in Carbondale, in Elizabethtown? I think they're going to, without detracting at all from President Carter, and I think he was a man of, of good intentions. He tried very hard to be a good president. Circumstances worked against him. I think, first of all, beginning with inaugural, President uh, Reagan has a unique capability, as he demonstrated in Southern Illinois when I traveled with him, to bring the best out in us, to make us proud of our country, and to give us a sense of ideals and goals that we can work together on. He's going to be less partisan than people would think. Uh, he's going to reach out a great deal more. He's going to build and develop uh, with our cooperation and help. And I think we'll have the closest working relationship, as I just said to him, that any president has had with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House uh, Committee on International Affairs. Uh, we're going to have a close relationship, but we're going to build a credible foreign policy where you know where we're going with precision and not have so much confusion, U-turns, and zigzags as we've had. That policy is going to be backed by a strong national defense because you can't have a credible foreign policy. You can't draw a line in the Gulf when you don't have a single ship there and say you don't go beyond this line without having the capability to carry it out. You're a laughing stock then. We're going to have it backed by strong defense, but then he's going to work on the economy. To have a strong economy that will then, I think, lessen the ravage of inflation and bring down interest costs will be a high objective and try mightily to balance this budget. All of us have to work with him on it because we have the clout to make that possible, and I think we can, we can work together in a bipartisan spirit. It's interesting that the day after the inauguration, a uh, member of the White House staff stopped to, in my office and said, we're not going to agree on everything, but we want to work together. It's interesting now the two days after the inauguration, you're meeting with him. I think this is a, is a wholesome sign. Let me ask one other question, because I have not met the new president yet, uh, but you have I'll worked see with, that you do. I, I'm, I, I, I'm looking forward to I, it. And of course, the, 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 the new well. vice president I've known for, for some years. But my impression is that he's a practical man, a, pr a pragmatist, uh, not an ideologue. Uh, now, that may be an inaccurate impression. What no, that's right. Uh, the dominant characteristic that came out after surveys were taken, independent surveys after eight years of Ronald Reagan's governorship in California, which would be the seventh largest nation in the world if it were a nation, was common sense. He is a man of common sense, utter decency, a, a wonderful feeling that you get with him. And you, as you know, Paul, I traveled with him so many days throughout it on my one day, 17 hours we were together, just every minute. And you get that sense of decency. He's not a, a person who can't change his mind. You know, I objected strongly to that plank in the platform on judges. He has since altered his judgment. He said he was going to abolish the Department of Education. Now he's thinking again about it. Uh, abolish the Department of Energy. He's thinking again about that. With new facts, he can be reasoned with, and he is a decent, honorable man. I think we can be very proud of him. Senator Charles Percy, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Next week, our guest will be your new junior senator, Alan Dixon. This has been In Touch with Paul Simon, a weekly report from your congressman on the issues that concern you the most presented as a public service by this station. If you would like Congressman Simon to answer one of your questions on the show, send your question and your name and address to In Touch, Congressman Paul Simon, 227 Cannon House Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515.